Welcome to Team All Blacks, a series of reflective interviews of some of the great names of New Zealand's rugby past. Today we talk with Murray Pearce, an All Black with a story all his own. A policeman, he found himself embroiled in the South African controversy during the mid-1980s, but went on to become a World Cup winning lock. Murray, you had something of a, of a traditional preparation for top level rugby. You, you had a grounding in the provinces, then you moved to the big city. How, how much of that early grounding was useful in your later rugby career? It was really useful from, I think, a self-confidence perspective. In other words, when I started out playing for the Wellington Club J2s, sorry, under 21Bs and then J2s, um, how good a player am I? And that was, that was the yardstick that every year I tried to improve how good I was and managed to go through the Wellington Club grades reasonably quickly. Uh, and then, of course, what I really enjoyed about going through that layer of, of rugby that you had back then, you had your club, your province and then the All Blacks, was the fact that um, each, each, at each layer you come up against better people to measure, measure yourself against. And that's what I really enjoyed, just that slow progression. The players, the modern players today that get thrown in the deep end, I really take my hat off to. They, uh, you know, they, don't, they haven't had that progression. A lot of them are in their low 20s. Uh, so for me, in my mid-20s, it, it was a self-confidence issue that got better and better at each level of rugby. Were you always a tall player? Were you always tall as a, as a young fella? Yes, yeah, and I was always, um, uh, always tall. Um, Struggled to make my college f first 15 back in the good old Dunstan High mid-70s, but um, uh, came up to Wellington, joined the police, and then I said, well, who do, who do you play for? And they said, well, through the Mount Vic Tunnels, the Wellington Club, that's where a lot of the police play for, so that, that'll do me, and uh, straight into lock and never look back. Yeah. And was there any sort of specific time when you felt you'd, you'd made the change, you'd jumped the gap, and suddenly you were a contender? For, for provincial honours especially? Uh, provincial honours, um, it was just, a, no, provincial honours was really just a matter of playing good club rugby consistently. And I used to enjoy uh, reading your reports in the, on the, uh, in the paper on, on Sundays and Mondays, Lynn, uh, around the, ga the club games. And if my name kept getting mentioned, I thought, well, that's got to be helpful. And sure enough, I got selected for the Wellington Bees in the early 80s uh, with Mick Horan. And then um, Sunday morning trainings down in the Marison Patch uh, Sawdust Gym. Great way to start the day, especially after finishing work in the police at about 2 or 3 that same morning. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's where it all started. And Mick Horan, he was, he was, you knew where you stood with Mick, which I really appreciated. And yeah, with under a couple of years in the Bs, managed to get into the A's and um, into the top Wellington team. And then from then, um, you know, just to head down, backside up and uh, thought, well, I'm going to see how far I can go in this game. And, uh, but the thing that really I, I really uh, came to learn quite early on was the fitter I got, the better I played. And back then, you know, we had, people have got to remember, we were working while well, I was working in the police doing shift work back then, and um, uh, trainings were sort of two, or th two nights, of, sort of a Tuesday and a Thursday. So... We had to do a fair bit of work ourselves, and I just found that, okay, if I come into the next season a bit fitter than I was this year, hopefully my play will improve. And I just found, yeah, the fitter I got, the better, better things went. As you're put in an interesting position compared to a lot of players. How hard was it to train with doing shift work? Uh, it was quite hard in that it was by yourself, because yes. obviously, obviously you're all your teammates are out you know, working in their, in their day jobs. So, it, but I used to uh, used to live in Nye, where there's plenty of hills, and I'd, I'd I'd go out on a sort of a 45 hour long aerobic run, and the next time I did that same hilly run, I'd try and go faster, and I just found that worked for me. And um, because back then, being back then as as a lock, you wanted to be reasonably big, but you also needed to be mobile because, you know, as, as, as the older viewers will remember, there was no lifting of the line outs back then. You had to jump yourself, and if you're a muscle-bound 120 kg player, you're not going to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. So there was always that fine balance between, between being a, a reasonable size, but also being fit and athletic. And it was a great time to be playing rugby too with Wellington at that stage. They were a pretty strong team. That's right. Yep, they were. And um, in fact, my first game for Wellington was in 1982. They just lost the Renfrew Shield in '81, but I managed to cash in on the uh, the thank you tour 
uh, from the Wellington Union, and that was a Northern Hemisphere um, uh, trip up to the U United Kingdom, and that was actually my first of my hundred and something games for Wellington was uh, on that particular tour. Okay, that must have been a great, great experience. Yeah, it was a, oh well, yeah, it was a massive experience. I mean, you had your, you know, your Bernie Frasers and your Stu Wilsons and Mexteds and you know, a lot of household names. And to be playing with and touring with them was, you know, absolutely eye-opening. And promotion became to the All Blacks came relatively quickly. I mean, you went away on the '84 tour to a, to Australia, probably as an apprentice. Did you take yeah. that view of it yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I, as I touched on before, I, how good am I? And there was uh, in 1983, Wellington had a Shield Challenge uh, against Canterbury down at, at at the then Lancaster Park, and I was marking uh, Albert Anderson, who was an All Black at the time and had a really good day up until my jaw got broken <laughs> but had a really good well that's i guess it, it's the canterbury payback for having a good game um and, and in the grandstand unbeknown to me was brian lahore the all black selector at the time and i heard he he i heard he was reasonably happy with my game and i thought right so that was eight, end of 83 that was the end of my season with a broken jaw and i thought right i'm going to give this a good crack for 84 and you're quite right i was probably you know we had a touring squad to Australia in 84 of, I think, 26 players, uh, one coach, one manager, uh, one physio, I think it was, and that was about the um, ad admin team at that stage. Uh, we had midweek games, and it was those midweek games where, you know, where I learned what being an All Black was all about. But I still rem remember it vividly, and what I really enjoyed about being in the All Blacks back then is all you had to do was worry about your role in other words, locking. Yeah. And you didn't have to worry or try and cover for other players. Uh, you just had to focus on doing your job properly. And your teammates around you obviously did the same thing. Hence, you know, hence we had some good rides and uh, some good, good results and, and um, you know, a, a successful era, actually. Having stepped up to that level, what, what changes or what realisations did you come to about your own role, as you said, that you, were, you, you had to play? Just, just how specialised it was, uh, and and how I had to get fitter again, and that that's that was really um, you know some of the fittest uh, the players at that, that stage ever got was at the end of a, a tour because you're playing midweek games also, so you might have a, a Saturday and a Wednesday and a Saturday game for instance. So, uh, but yeah, just I enjoyed the whole environment touring, and and the comra camaraderie that came with it. Uh, we won the Test Series, we won most of the, I think we won all the midweek games. Um, so yeah, that was a good time, that sowed the seed and then at the end of 84 we actually had a, a, a tour of Fiji and that was a fascinating experience. Uh, we all got out alive and um, but yeah, really enjoyable time in Fiji, scored a couple of tries. Um, which I was very proud of because locks back then didn't score that many tries. They were busy doing their job, not not out on the wing. Um, so that yeah, that was a good fun. And then uh, and then uh, yeah, my '85 rolled around and I Eight, thought '85 was yeah. a, is a is an interesting year for for several reasons, obviously. But you were a new boy in there. It was your you made your test debut against England. That's right. But running right through the whole season was whether you were going to be touring South Africa or not. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, quite right. That was, the, uh, that was always in the back of our minds is, is the South Africa thing on or off. Um, and um, yeah, 85, first test against England down at uh, Lancaster Park and I think here in Crowell, I think that was his first test too and he kicked five six, penalties. Six penalties, six penalties thank yeah. you. And we scraped him with a win, but luckily back then, the selection policy around all black teams is if you keep winning, you'll stay in the team. And But we knew that as a team we had to really improve for that second test at Athletic Park uh, in 85. And, and luckily that's uh, um, marking Wade Dooley. I'll never forget that. He was a massive policeman at the time. And yeah, that was a, that was a big game for our, our, many of us, and we won that one, and then it took off from there. It was one of the great All Black forward performances I seem to recall. Just you just had complete control of the British that day, of the English team that day. I'll, I'll take your words here, Lynn. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you on that one. Um, but yeah, it was it was my second test. The first test just went in a blur. I mean, it's just so well back then. It was so fast. Uh, a, 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 the speed of the game was just so fast, but in the second test, a lot of us newbies started to adjust. And, and you're right, we we had to front that day. The pressure was on, and uh, luckily came out with a comfortable victory. Yeah, fellow Kerwin didn't do too bad in that game either. Yeah, is it? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll um, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> no, no, fair enough. 
Well, of course, then once that series is over, all the concentration goes on the South Africa tour. You were also in, a, in an interesting position again because you're a policeman. How did how did that tie in after all that had happened in 1981? You're a policeman. You're playing yeah. rugby, and South Africa's on the agenda. Yeah, that that was a, a, definitely a complicating factor. I mean, if we go back, the, every All Blacks dream is to play against South Africa, and back then it was politically it just wasn't on. And and uh, but in '85, the um, there was a, a lot of players, you know, the Ashworths, the Knights, the Daltons, the Haydens, Mick Steads, uh, Wilson, Bernie Fraser, they were, a lot of them were hanging around for that 85 tour, and, um, uh, and rightly so too, they earned the right to tour South Africa in my opinion. Um, so, but unfortunately, I'll never forget it, actually out at um, the good old Polo Ground and um, uh, out in, in Miramar and um, yeah, heard that the lawyers had succeeded, the tour was off and, and yeah, we were, we were pretty devastated but obviously it was beyond our, our control and we just had to put up with it. But then of course the undercurrents started with the uh, Cavaliers tour in 86 and yeah. I think a lot of the, you know, the, as I say, a lot of the older All Blacks could see that it was possibly going to happen in 86 so they pl extended their careers by another year to um, to tour. To, to yeah. What about some of the, the subterfuge, if you like, that went on with the, with the uh, Cavaliers tour? Was it, was it difficult times to live through? No, uh, it wasn't. Personally for me, no, it wasn't difficult. Either people were too gutless or, or didn't, they never fronted me one-on-one -on -one yep. with, with their objections. It got a bit tough at home, though, because we were living up in Nio and there was, uh, with my wife and, and yeah, one young baby at the time, one young son, and it got a bit rough there because black wreaths, anti-apartheid black wreaths, were being put at the front door of the house. Is that right? So that was a bit scary for my wife being at home, me working shift work, maybe away on an all-black tour somewhere. Um, so that that was that that sent a bit of a chill down the spine, and um, yeah, as a consequence, my wife had to shift out. Just it was just too dangerous, obviously, to uh, to. But that was the that was the worst. Luckily, yep. uh, both. Um, um, as I say, physically nobody ever fronted me, or um, or verbally no one no one fronted us. But the black wreath sort of got the message through that this this was um, things were happening. And what what was the attitude of the police department? Yeah, they were very good actually. They, yeah. I can't speak highly enough. Um, back then, it, uh, you know, the police were really behind the sport. They encouraged sport at all different uh, levels, and yeah, they were right behind me. Um, uh, but it, it, yeah, politically it, it worked out fine. I managed to, um, as I say, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it, managed to tour the Cavaliers tour and, and went back into my day job back in the police. And um, so I was very, very thankful of the support that I had back then. The Cavaliers tour was my next question. But that must have been an, an interesting experience on its own, forgetting the fact that you weren't actually representing New Zealand, but to be there, to yeah. feel the atmosphere, the, I yeah. mean, the South Africans were obviously built up for it. It must have been... Fantastic. Oh yeah, no, it was it was uh, an extremely memorable time, and a long yeah, it was a long tour. Midweek games, they were all hard games. Played at altitude in the heat. Refereeing was still somewhat biased, <laughs> and um, but yeah, great experience, um, and a, quite a good grounding for me too because I was only a young All Black at that stage, still learning the ropes, and yeah, I learnt a lot on that trip. Well, you'd have, been, you'd have been paired with Andy Hayden, who you hadn't played a lot with. You played a couple of games with Andy. Or certainly uh, in the touring party. Yes, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Gary Wheaton was there, Andy Hayden, myself. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a really learning experience. A great country to tour, fell in love with the country. Uh, we had a lot of support over there, uh, especially amongst the black community, because they, um, they loved the All Blacks and, um, and what we were trying to achieve. But at... Um, but yeah, fond memories, fell in love with the country then and, and, and uh, actually towards the end of my career I actually went back and played there again. Yeah. You, you came back from there, obviously served a two match suspension or a one match suspension depending on how you read the, the, law, the decision at the time, but uh, was that a bit frustrating? The fact that the, the, the baby blacks had come in, they'd beaten France and they, they did reasonably well in the first test against Australia, was there a bit of nervousness that perhaps some of these young fellows might have come through? Um, 
Yeah, we, we, yeah, we got a two-game two game suspension. You, you're right, they won the first game down in Christchurch, didn't they? And I think they, I remember sitting on the grandstand watching them in the second test of the Athletic Park. The first test of the Athletic Park. Was it? Yeah. yeah. And, they, and anyway, they lost one of them. And uh, I think that loss definitely helped uh, us all Blacks coming through ex Cavaliers to yeah. uh, definitely help with the call up. What about the reunification for the when when the two groups came together for that second right. test in Dunedin? Yeah, no no trouble at all. I mean yeah. that that was the unique thing about when I was playing the All Blacks. Yeah, Auckland rugby was dominating and at Canterbury and but it was all the co well, hardly had, the coaches hardly had to mention it, but they just said, you know, guys, you know, we're all the one team here, forget your provincial um, alliances. We're all one team, and away we go. And that was personally, that was never an issue. Combining, and um, uh, we all knew we had to combine, otherwise we wouldn't. But you wouldn't be in the team, and you wouldn't win any test matches. So. Of course, that was a great era too against Australia. They'd come up, and Al Alan Jones was was singing from the yes. the front, leading yes. the team, and kept dreaming up all sorts of stuff. It must have been must have been a great time to be taking them on. Oh, it was too, because you had the Campisi coup and battle happening at the time too, and that was always you know, the other. Uh, the media always enjoyed that that battle. Um, for me, playing Australia is probably one of the most terrifying tests I ever played, because I had the uh, the joy of marking a, a Steve Skylab Cutler, and he I'm six foot six. He's at least six foot eight, with arms to match, and uh, we all had to jump by ourselves in the lineouts back then. There was very little lifting. The odd help now and again, but. Um, uh, and yeah, I used to dread marking Steve Cutler because he was such a big, and he could jump too. He could he could really leap. So, uh, so to answer your question, yes, luckily we I think only lost once to Australia in the test that I played. But I used to have nightmares leading up to that, visualising Steve Cutler having two-handed take after two-handed take. So, what were some of the coping strategies to deal with? It? What can you recall? Did you have anything to try and take him on? Uh, no, n nothing, nothing specific. Just to. Um, just to uh, hope that he had an off day. Um, it's too hard to stand on their boots. I mean, that, you, you can't, they're too hard to do that. I also enjoyed getting up in the air too, getting vertical and, and contesting. But I th I, listen, I'd like to think that we come out pretty pretty much 50-50 in those test matches, but luckily I come out good enough to, with a victory on our side. And as I said before, you, you won this test, you're going to be selected for the next one. Yeah. And of course, after that Australian tour, there was the, the French tour, the famous second test in Nantes. Oh yes, yes, yeah, 86, um, France, hard country to tour. You pay a French selection, French selection, and when I say French selection, these are shadow French teams gearing up for the test match, and then you have another French selection. They'll give you an interpreter that hardly speaks any English. <laughs> the bus driver gets lost. Uh, real hard, real hard country, to t but enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, 86 Nantes. We were pretty exhausted. We'd, it had been a long season and a long, yeah, a really long season. And a lot of us were pretty stuffed at that stage, carrying injuries. And as it turned out, we were probably true because we said after that match, mate, if there's ever a team high on drugs, it's these jokers and that test match. Because they came out, and I'll never forget seeing, I think it was the French props running out with blood coming down their forehead where they'd been headbutting the wall of the changing room, I found afterwards. And then the first light, the first kickoff came. They kicked off to us, and all that, you know, all the, all, the, all black forwards sort of got around to take the kick. And I reckon every eight of us got smashed out of the way by this French forward pack that just come and bulldozed us apart. And we looked at each other and thought, "Shit, we've got a game on here." <laughs> and unfortunately, well, yeah, we one of the few losses, one of the few Test match losses I suffered was that game, but. It turned out to be a blessing in '87. Of course, it was that you had the World Cup on the horizon. Now, the, it was a unique situation. This was something that had never happened before. What was the feeling going? Did you realise that you were on the cusp that was of something that was going to change Test rugby? No, I don't think so. I think um, gee, it's going back a thirty odd years now. It was uh, it was a real changing the guard. Actually, about '85, '86, as I, you know, a lot of the a lot of the Ashworth Knights, Daltons, Mixteds. Wilson's phrases had all retired, and Wayne Smith too, uh, and then we had a new, lot of new blood coming in. So there was a fair bit of uncertainty, and then even of course the tournament itself, Andy Dalton pulled a leg muscle, and he was out of the turn. You know, our captain, our leader was out of the tournament. So step up, David Kirk. Um, 
So yeah, a lot of uncertain, a lot of new players coming in. You know, the other, you know, um, well, relatively new, but you know, the the Michael Joneses and and um, you know the Sean Fitzpatricks were just starting out, um, and Zinni was you know, young then, and um, Kirk and then Grant Fox and yeah, so a lot of new players, untested, really didn't know what we're in for, and and I think I think the first opening game at, at Eden Park. Uh, against Italy, I, I don't even think it was a packed out stadium then. But um, as the tournament went on, like we've seen recently with cricket, World Cups, etc., yeah. as, as the tournament progressed, the public got in behind it. And then we started to realise just how important this tournament was. And, and you get caught up in the wave, and, and away we went. Yeah. Memorable uh, semi final against Wales and, and Ballymore. Yes, extremely memorable. Um, uh, every now and again, you go, you go on tour, you're living with the same people all the time, and things get a bit, you know, you just get a bit pissed off. You get frustrated. You just get frustrated. And then uh, uh, now and again, alcohol would provide us a great release. Now, I'm not going to go into too many details, but we had a really good session, I think, about three days before that, uh, that semi final in Australia. And. Um, that just it, it released a lot of tension, and yeah, we we knew that if we lost that game, we were back to work on Monday. I think yeah, and um, well, same but same with the quarterfinal against Scotland. Yeah, you, know, you lose on Saturday, you're back to work Monday, and there's no way we want to go back to work. So, so yeah, that uh, that match, I remember um, remember I remember seeing our captain um, Buck Shelford um, showing some physicality to one player, and I thought, oh, this is could this could be messy, but luckily the uh, the poor recipient who's lying on his back on the ground <laughs> after receiving some treatment from Buck, he was the man that was sent off, so that, that was fine. Yep. Um, but yeah, really good. Um, we just, as I say, every test match in that um, World Cup campaign in 87, we just wanted to improve, and uh, it worked out well. Yeah, and of course you arrived against your arch rival France. I yes. mean, there must have been a bit of trepidation going into it. Uh, we, our levels of confidence were pretty good then. Uh, you know, we were humming nicely. We, I didn't think we had any major injury concerns that whole campaign. And a lot of us played in 86 and Nantes when we lost. Yes. And this was the chance for revenge. And that, uh, as I say, that 86 loss turned out to be a, a blessing in disguise for that World Cup final. And, um, uh, yeah, a lot of us wanted revenge. And that was the... That was a massive day. I was, I was going to say, what, yeah. what was the day like for a player? But we stayed at the Paranamu, which is over on the North Shore. That's where the All Blacks stayed back then. And um, when you hop on your coach to go to, the, to Eden Park, there will be a handful of, a sprinkling of, of true supporters there to see you off. This particular day we left, cause, uh, I think 2.30, 3 o'clock kickoff, so we would have left there about 1. And there would have been... Th oh, Gee, hundreds of people there, and we thought, wow, this is big. You know, we hadn't really appreciated, we knew it was big, but when we saw the public support at that stadium, uh, at that hotel, we thought this is, and then I'll never forget the bus trip, and the bus trip can be one of the most nervous times of that whole day, because, you know, it's, you know your mind is free to think about the game, and the butterflies are flying, and the adrenaline's pumping, and then as we're driving to the Eaton Park for that final, there was... A lot of people standing on the road, cars tooting horns, yelling, screaming, supporting us. And we, and by the time we got that stadium, we were just buzzing before kickoff. So it was almost a case of settle down, boys. Don't be too early. Yeah. And uh, and the way we went. And the game itself, any particular memories of the game? No, not not real. Uh, no, nothing specific. No tries to talk about, unfortunately, Lynn. But. Yeah. Um, I do remember, I think they scored with about two or three minutes to go and, and uh, I remember you know, way, w raising the fist to the, to the crowd to say we'd won and this whole crowd just erupted in unison and uh, yeah, great feeling standing up, uh, go, actually you may remember going up the steps to the Eden Park grandstand to receive the cup and just a yeah, great buzz, a real massive sense of relief though because the, yeah, pressure, I was going to say, the yeah. pressure had been building in the whole tournament and it was just nice to get the result we wanted. And uh, back to work on Monday. Back to work on Monday, yeah, exactly <laughs> was too. 
And uh, yeah, well, that's you know, it's such a different era now. But yeah, we had to go back to work Monday. We had to, and luckily, this is where the police were really good to me that I, my fortnightly pays continued. But yeah, you, know, you had your self-employed farmers and courier truck drivers, and that that they lost money to yeah. play play for their countries. So. There was one more game, of course, that year, the Bledisloe Cup game, when the Aussies who had and played during the World Cup thought that they could actually claim the status. Yeah, that's here. right. Yeah, and that was in Australia, um, and there was no way. That we knew if we had lost that game, guess who would have been crying about uh, who should have been the world champion. And yeah. there, was no, there was no way we were going to lose that one. And of course, it was also the last test for, for Brian Lahore as, as coach of the side. What, did, what How did you find Brian as, as a coach, amongst the coaches that you mean you, you were under, Grizz, Wiley and, and Brian, the two different types of coaches? Yeah, the first coach I had in 84 uh, to Australia was Bryce Rope. And then uh, Brian Lahore, best coach, uh, best All Black coach I ever had. You know, just you know, good country man. You know, Brian Lahore, he's black or white. You know where you stand with him, and that's that's what I like about people. Um, and he just knew how to connect with with um, you know with everybody. And um, well, he was obviously a highly respected man for a start off. And uh, but no, he um, uh, with him and David Kirk at the helm. You know, we had a great era, so. Uh, but yeah, the after Bri BJ retired, it was into the Griswold era, so and that was that was an entertaining time uh, period of rugby too. But luckily, by then we had a um, a core group of of players that had had uh, come through together in sort of 86, 87 World Cup, and then the year 88, 89, yeah. 90 had a really good run. And the, the, I mean, obviously, your first first tour was with. To Australia again with with uh, with Grizz in charge. An interesting tour game because the, that second test you couldn't quite put it away and it was a sixteen all draw. So suddenly you go into a last test needing to still win the series. Yes, yeah. I can actually, can, to be blunt, I can't remember too much about that series. Um, we obviously won the series, otherwise because you always remember your losses. Um, but yeah, which it, it um, yeah we had a chance. It was a Brisbane, I think that sixteen all draw. It was. Yeah, yes. yeah, and we had a chance to win that, but. Didn't take it, didn't lose it, but uh, but no, no, and, and it was that draw that really fired us up for the third and final. And I think, if our memory takes me correctly, that there was a rather interesting team meeting on the Sunday after that draw. Oh, okay, one of those team meetings. Yes. Yeah, that, that's that's. I touched on that briefly before, where yeah. you just released the pressure and and and. Uh, and uh, well, as you found out, we performed the next test very Certainly. well. Yeah. yeah. It was a good time though because it was a it was a solidification of a lot of those younger players who'd come through. Yeah. David Kirk had, had gone, but Bruce Deans came in, and then you had Michael Jones really starting to shine, and John Gallagher was shining yeah. as well, and Johnny Schuster came into it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, quite right. And and um, when you make an All Black team, you want you you're very well. I was very happy to make the All Black team, but then you want to be part of a successful era. And that's where uh, you know players of that stature and, and and tremendous careers, and we all came together at the same time and had a, as I say had a great period through the mid 80s to to, to the end of the 80s and early 90s. So, um, but yeah, great players and um, um, uh, especially John Schuster and John Gallagher, both ex Wellington provincial teammates too. So, uh, yeah. but no, they they were um, they were good times. Were you surprised when John went to league? Um, did you have any from inkling? A, no, no inkling. Um, from a monetary point of view, yes, I could understand why. Um, but uh, oh, listen, he he obviously wanted to do it. He tried it, and um, it didn't quite work out to be what what he thought it was going to be. But back then, there was you know, let's face it, we're all amateur players. We're all trying to scratch around for a living. Yeah. And if somebody comes up and offers you a, a, a different code with some money attached to it. Um, uh, it would have been an interesting decision to make. With my physicality and athletic ability, I didn't have any issues around <laughs> being approached to play league. But uh, oh, good luck! No, good luck to the people. There's only one way to find out, and that's give it a go. Yeah, what, what, just tell us about John as, as a fullback. You mean you had a lot of time with him for Wellington and so forth? Just describe some of his qualities. Oh, just a real genuine good palm, and he was a genuine palm. Um, Don Bond coerced him uh, into coming to New Zealand and then playing for the Orange Hill Rugby Club as, as was compulsory if you dealt with Don Bond. And then uh, from that obviously Bondy was the manager in the Wellington team uh, at the same time. So, But yeah, really good bloke, down to earth, not not a big physical specimen um, because back, back then the, you know, the players weren't as big 
uh, you had your ter- you know, your terrier rights who were fast and could swerve. You know, probably John Kerwin was the start of the of the big the big backs we'll call them. Um, yeah, little Grant Fox at first five. So you know, you're not physically not big, but um, at at the rugby at that stage, you didn't need to be a massive. You needed to have good pace. But John Gallagher, you know, he um, spoke good English, and a um, uh, really an intelligent player, you know, and made very very few mistakes, and and could really could run to you know through that gap in the back line. You, Brilliant. You also played through that era under several captains. Uh, you had Andy Dalton, right. and Jock Hobbs, of course, came into it, and then was d- denied the Rugby World Cup when he retired early due to concussion That's issues. Right. What, what sort of captain was Jock? Jock, I didn't play terribly much with Jock. Um, oh, listen, to be an All Black captain, you've got to be a man's man and and, and be be that, that much better than than uh, most people anyway. So. Um, but you're right, Andy Dalton, I played with David Kirk, um, Buck Shelford obviously had a good good run, run there with Buck. Um, but yeah, they're all they're all leaders. The you, know, you would follow them into the out of the trenches, um, no trouble at all. And um, but no, Jock unfortunately due to his concussion issues didn't um, really sad actually because um, really good you know, open side flanker. Yeah. But no, I didn't play too much with Jock. And then, of course, as his replacement, as it turned out, was the uh, incomparable Michael Jones. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> what, what did you think when you actually did you when he came into the side? Did you know much about him? No, nothing. No, not very much at all. But I'll never forget we had a we had a, a World Cup trial match. I think up in Wong, uh, Wongaray between sort of a oh I don't know possibles, probables, probably. And luckily, I was on Michael Jones's team. And uh, at training runs, uh, we would have the we'd throw the line, you know, just dummy line outs with the back line all, all set up. And it was just a training run. And you don't, yeah, you, know, you go 80% at training runs. You don't put 100%. In. Well, Michael Jones was off the back of the line out, and we'd pass it out. It would get out to about the centre of the wing, and then jo- Michael Jones was tackling them. <laughs> and they didn't like it. The, back, the outside backs did not like it at all. He was an absolute freak and a lovely man. Um, uh, but just so athletic for, for that, you know, for that era of rugby, yeah. uh, he was just uh, like a panther. He was he was everywhere, and um, you know, brilliant to brilliant to try and keep try and catch up with on the rugby field. You you, you had one last tour to uh, to Ireland and Wales in '89, and that was, I suppose that was the start of an era because of the the team video that uh, John Kerwin and Rick Salizzo, were, were, the public got a much more of a look at the team than had ever been the case before, and. It, it sort of showed the spirit that was around in that side at that time. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, you know, a winning team's always a happy team, and we and we were, and that, that was a great tour actually. Eighty nine, you know, we, gee, we had the, um, you know, Wales and Ireland, and then the game against the Barbarians uh, in London, and yeah, you know, we're playing the Nice and the Clare, these and that, you know, the midweek games they were hard, yeah, and then the Test match on the Saturday, probably a squad of twenty. 20, probably 27, 28 players playing midweek games. So yeah, it was it was full on, but um, you know it was it was that was a really good tour. We uh, Bruce Wiley, the coach, and um, um, but yeah, it was really good. It re- unified the team. We had some tough rugby games, finishing off against uh, against the Barbarians. But it was the English team. And the English team were just besotted, and they just really wanted to beat us. And uh, likewise, we really wanted to beat them. So um, the English had a very quiet after-match function. I remember that vividly after that, uh, <laughs> after that uh, unbeaten tour of 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 uh, uh, an '89 of Ireland and Wales. Yeah, and I think it was 1990. You you opted out of New Zealand rugby and went over to South Africa. What was the what was the thinking there? Well, it goes back to the Cavaliers tour in '86 when I fell in love with the country and thought if I'm going to finish my rugby, I would love to play a season in South Africa just to you know, experience the lifestyle and and played uh, played for a year at the Berea uh, Berea Rovers Club in Durban and really enjoyed it. It really brought our family a lot closer. I had two sons at that, young sons at that stage, brought our family a lot closer because this was, everything was foreign to us, including obviously the lifestyle in Durban and South Africa at the time. Um, but really enjoyed it and then, but ne- uh, never forget watching the All Blacks run out and play a test match in New Zealand. And then I got thinking, right, if I went back at this stage of the season I could play, get my 100 games up for Wellington, which I, you know, which I managed to do, and if I play really well I'll get on the end of year tour to France. And so 
we act, unfortunately got burgled quite badly in in Durban, and that was just you know with me being out playing rugby and working during the day, it was too dangerous for the family perspective. So we came back to New Zealand early, got back in the Wellington team, played my hundred and ended up hundred and I don't know hundred and two, hundred and three games in Wellington, and then made the All Black Tour to France that year. But at that stage, thirty two years old, young family growing up. I really, it was either all black test rugby or nothing, you know, and that might sound arrogant, but that was just parable. with a job to do, to earn money, I, I had to make a decision. And there was a young player who had come through the grades called Ian Jones, and uh, I was reserved for the two test matches, but um, with ankle issues and a couple of other things, I couldn't make the test team, so I thought, no, I want to retire on my terms. I'd seen other players get told to retire, and what it had done to them, and I vowed never to go down that track. So I thought, no, nah, 1990, I'm fit and healthy, 32 years old, still got, you know, still got plenty of time to, to get a good career going. And uh, so yeah, Ian Jones was the incumbent back then, and and stayed there for many years, which was great to see. Um, so yeah, I I retired at the end of, uh, the end of that French tour. But but having already lived a full All Blacks life, I mean, first, yeah. first World Cup winners and That's so right. forth. I mean. Great yep. memories. Oh, I was me great memories, Len. I threw fifty something games. Uh, I think we lost a couple, drew a couple, and won the rest. And and you know my dreams were um, were met. As I say, made the All Blacks. And then was part of a successful All Black team, and um, still enjoy following them. And um, yeah, and may that continue. Good on you. Thank you very much for your time, Murray. It's been great talking with you. No problem. Man.